And we're recording. Hi, everybody. My name is Rainier. I'm one of the co-presidents of Volt, and I am here today with one of my close friends, Gilberto. Would you like Hello, to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Gilberto. Uh, my favorite color today is black. Hashtag black. <laughs> um, I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a student. I'm an activist. I'm an advocate um, for human rights, social justice, but also I work in the field of future of work. And I'm a student of public administration, international European governance um, at Leiden University and a John Lewis Fellow for Humanity in Action. Yeah. Nice. Cool um, things. So thanks for, uh, for joining today. Um, we've been uh, shocked by what's happening in, um, in the United States. And it also ignited a lot of debate and demonstrations here in Europe. And we're both from the Netherlands, but we ha are having this conversation in English because Volt is a European movement. And this is also more than a U US or Dutch problem. Um, and what has struck me as uh, interesting about this is that we have been talking about whether the mayor of Amsterdam took the right decision. We have been talking about how people respond, about who takes which side in this uh, uh, discussion. And all of these things and heated emotions eventually stop us from talking about what's really here. And that's the underlying issue. To what extent do we have institutionalized discrimination and racism in our society? And if the answer is yes, we have that and we have it not, then what should we do about it and how can we do that? And that's why uh, I asked you to have this conversation with me online so we can talk about it. And thanks for um, thank you for joining. Uh, you're welcome. And I think it's always interesting to to really have a conversation that dives in deep within these topics because most of the time we have conversations that are very superficial. Um, we're like, oh, you felt you felt hurt or you felt uh, you, you felt offended. Um, we we tend to focus race on feelings. Um, racial injustice is just about feelings. It's just about feeling hurt. Um, and sometimes we're like, oh yeah, because slavery ended a long time ago. Um, so so we don't notice. Um, the gigantic impact that racial injustice and um, yeah, institutionalized racism has in the lives of black people and people of color um, in Europe, but also in the world, in the Netherlands, in the US, everywhere. It's shaped, it has shaped our society to be the way that it is. Yeah, there's so much things I would like to dive into already, but be before we go there, I want to ask you, how have you experienced the last week? I mean, it's definitely been intense, especially with regards to, look, we're, we're all at home. So, so, so the only way that you actually connect with people is online. And when you open Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and anything, all that you see is, um, you know, this pain of black people being oppressed, um, killings and, and, and violence against black people um, and, and, and just this. It, it, it just you just see the oppression and the injustice and that hurts and it makes you angry and it makes you sad and it makes you mad and you're like and, and at the same time you're expected to continue to function normally you know you have to do your work you have to hand in your thesis you have to work on your papers you're expected to do all of these things but at the same time um, being assaulted by all of these feelings and, and these feelings that reflect on people that look like you um, people that um, you 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 might know, like it's funny i was in i was in minneapolis last year mm -hmm. and i found out you know that a friend of mine um has met george floyd you oh, know so yeah. so we're yeah so we're one removed from each other which is crazy um yeah. and, and that tells yeah. you that yeah and and so th these feelings you described that you've experienced in the past week is that something that uh, is a sort of constant always in the background uh, of your day-to-day -day life, or does it only rise up when things like this happen? I mean, obviously right now it's worse. Like, it's not, it's not always like, oh my gosh, racism. Um, oh, it seems that one of our internet connections might be broken. And the I fact that it's been 
Um, this specific week. Roberto, uh, my internet connection was unstable. Could you start from um, um, where you said that it's sometimes uh, more uh, present than other times? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I think I think sometimes it's very much um, like let, let's let's say this past week has just been very intense because of the fact that it's so visible and it's so in your face, and that people and that it requires someone dying for us to talk about it. Yeah. While in other moments that we we you know we share things and we talk about it, and nobody takes you seriously until there's that. that you know, the fact that it has to cost people's lives and there has to be visible violence for it to even become an issue is a problem and says how much society actually values Black people and Black lives. Yeah, and so, so I, I think that for my position, it's almost impossible to comprehend that. And um, would you agree or do you think that people that uh, have been uh, like me kind of white privileged um, um, can can imagine what it's like or do you think they can never imagine what it's like? I would say, you know, the thing is you can never, you can never walk fully in another person's shoes. Um, whether that's me and you or you and black people um, is, 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 it's obviously it's impossible to understand things fully, but you can understand that you don't understand. Yeah. And you can understand that there is a lot of oppression going on and a lot of injustice. If, if there was ever a moment that you felt excluded, that you felt alone, that you felt as though people didn't care about you, imagine that moment. But now imagine that that, it is happened, that has happened systematically forever. So you, you can come close, but you can never be there. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, I'm trying to imagine that as we speak, and I find it very hard. Um, but indeed, I can understand that I do not understand. And so what I wanted to ask you is, you said in the beginning that uh, some people say, well, slavery ended a really long time ago, but did it really end that long ago? Uh, I mean, 1863, if I'm correct, and uh, you were describing uh, how your family situation uh, has been, and that for you, it's not that far away, because you still relate to people that are closer to the ones that experienced it. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my great grandmother's mother was the daughter of a slave. Um, and I knew my great grandmother. Um, and my father knew my great grandmother's mother. So, so that being said, that means that it's, it's super close. I, I know someone that has had contact with a slave. Yeah. And, 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 and that, are, are as, as we like to see, somebody that has been enslaved because, because people didn't choose to be slaves. They, yeah. they, they were made to be slaves. Um, and, and that tells you that the impact that it has on communities, because, because suddenly um, you're not enslaved anymore, suddenly you're free, but everybody in your society and around you, um, everybody in your society has more economic freedom than you do because you are still dependent on on the plantation owners for food, you're still dependent on them for property. And, and, and when we talk about that, um, what is the result of that in people's bodies, in their, in their legacy, in their family legacy? Um, they have not had capital. That means that their socioeconomic status was already low because you couldn't get loans if you were enslaved or if you were black. I come from Curacao. Um, so so as from, from an island context, you know, um, there was this white elite, and there was also um, poorer white people. But even the poorer white people had it, still had it better off than the island elite. So, yeah. so when we understand that, we need to recognize that this legacy continues to play to the same because it changes your behavior. It changes the way you think. Um, for example, a lot of people talk about laziness, right? Like, um, why, do, why did a lot of black people not like doing a lot of work? Um, I've, heard right that I've heard that stereotype before. Yes, definitely. But but let's 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 analyze that from a, a contextual generational perspective. If I am a slave, or if I am enslaved, would I want to work very hard for the person that is forcing me to produce for them? 
definitely not. At least I would not. I, and when people tell me what to do, I have a reaction that I tend to not want to do what they tell me to do. Exactly. And, and now think about if this was done for hundreds of years, 400 years, right? And then we've, we've had more time in slavery um, than we've had time out of slavery. Um, and, and I think it's like twice the time. So, so, so when we think about that, that relevant, it's, it's only been like 150 something years. Um, maybe 170 now. So, so, so that's, yeah. And, and so I'm thinking of uh, something that I, a realization I had at one point in life where I saw how the um, experience my grandparents had in the war had shaped their character, which, taught, which uh, made them raise my parents in a certain way, which shaped their character, which therefore shaped how they raised me and shaped who I am today. Yeah. I can imagine that something similar might be there for you. Definitely. And just, just think about that situation mm -hmm. and think about it being the war having extended for 400 years. You know, like, like think, think of the war <laughs> taking so long. Yeah, you know, that, that, that everybody that was raised during that period, their mindset was also, how do I cope and survive in these enslaved conditions? How do I survive in this condition of pain? You know, and, 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 and then having to, in all honesty, it's, it's amazing how far black people have come um, in such a short period of time, having to unlearn everything by themselves, decondition themselves, change their way of thinking, um, try to be entrepreneurial, try to reach out and help others, and also survive in a society that still treats them worse than white people and still has systems created that are meant to to hurt them and to keep them down so this is actually a really nice bridge to today's world and i would like to focus on the netherlands and europe and um uh, this is also i think a blind spot for me because i can't know what you are experiencing and i try to look it up on google and try to find facts and figures about it and the only thing I could find was a recent study how uh, COVID-19 affects uh, ethnic minorities in Europe more than it affects people that uh, are white. Um, but besides that, it was hard for me to find facts and figures about it. And usually facts and figures help me to comprehend something. So what can you tell me about racism, discrimination in day-to-day -day Europe? I think one of the first things is that we don't like to talk about race. In Europe, we like to act as though we're colorblind. Um, there's a saying in Dutch that, that a lot of people say, exiging kleur, yeah. I don't see color. Um, but it's interesting, right? Because you do see color. I mean, I see you, you see me. Um, I am not colorless. And that shouldn't be, that's not bad to recognize that someone has a different yeah. ethnic expression than you. Um, Look, race in that sense doesn't exist because race, um, race is a social construct, but the impact of racism has shaped race. Racism actually has created race instead of race creating racism. Uh -huh. If you understand what I mean. Yeah, yeah that's a, um, a different uh, point of, a different way of looking at it. The cause and effect is the other way around. Yeah, it, it, it is because, because it wasn't that, like, I mean, people were enslaved, but they were enslaved in a way of, there, there, there were certain ideas of what it meant to be a slave back in the day in Africa that were entirely different in the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade was brutal. Um, it, it meant ownership forever of this individual and dehumanization of the person from a person to a thing, an object that I could own. Um, and, and that they were mine forever. So, so, so that transformation created created race because people were seeing oh those people are less than me because they're not human beings yeah. they are property so and yeah and, no please please ask and um so so you have to, we have to look at it from another uh, cause and effect chain and then back to to nowadays so you started by saying we tend to not want to talk about it mm. like we 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 like comfort you know, there is this, especially in the Netherlands, there is this discomfort when it comes to talking about the questions of race, 
because what happened um, led to people acting as though racism was not a problem here because there were no black people here. Um, there were mostly no black people in in Europe up to a couple of years ago, right? Like 60, 70 years. Um, um, a lot of black people started moving in because of migration, because of um, the colonies um, changing and people started to really live among the people in the Netherlands. And so, so it started to become an even bigger issue. However, even when people were not living here, there were still very negative outlooks on, on people of color and, and, and black yeah. people. Um, we can look at Cinder Class, like, like, like that's uh, Black Pete, Black Pete and, and... Can you explain, uh, because I'm not sure whether all European listeners, viewers know what Black Pete is. Could you ex explain what it is? So it's, it comes from the, the tradition of St. Nicholas. And it's a party that um, we in the Netherlands celebrate. And we, you know, kids get toys. It's all nice and everything. But then um, the saint um, comes with his helpers. And his helpers happen to be Black people. Um, or they happen to be caricatures of Black people, specifically Moors, um, with big red lips and um, dark, dark, dark skin. So, so, so like pitch black skin. Yeah. Um, and they... That's how, that's how I celebrated as a kid as well. Yeah, like, like in Curacao, we also celebrated it like that. So just saying. Um, but what's offensive about it is that it is a, it's a reduction of black people where people are seen as props. They're props for our fun, for our enjoyment, um, Black Pete is not known as a smart person. Black Pete has an accent. Black Pete um, is a, a scary man. So back when we, when we were small, um, well, Black Pete would come and, and people would get scared because, because he was going to chase you down and steal you and take you away. And, and St. Nicholas was the kind one, you know? So, so, so it was, Black Pete is an image that aims to create a, a, a portrait of Black people as though they are barbaric and only they only serve a purpose of entertainment. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing wrong with being entertaining, but if all that you are is this individual, that's problematic. And that, and that is the message that informs our society today. Yeah, and, and what's, what's interesting uh, uh, or sad also is for the past seven years, this has been a massive debate within the Netherlands and people are actually demonstrating almost fighting each other and stuff and we as Volt were one of the first political parties I think the very first to denounce Black Pete and say hey guys let's try to take each other's uh, uh, positions into account and not hold on to this construct and it's I've never gotten so much hated hatred on one public statement although we chose a humoristic way to, to, to share it, we got like the, the, the amount of negative comments and people wishing you to die and stuff. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, and it's interesting because it's a placeholder for undealt racism because it's a way that people, oh, we're just celebrating a party, but it's the party, look, symbols have meaning behind it. Even if, even if they're, mm -hmm. even if it was another color, right? Um, when we think about what the, what does it mean to people and what is it holding back? Um, the fact that people feel so attacked um, for changing it to, to, to wish you to die says that they love the symbology of it, that black people are inferior. Um, and it's not something that anybody would admit because admitting that to yourself is saying that you're racist and we don't like saying that. We don't like telling ourselves that we're racist. We like telling ourselves that we're progressive and we're tolerant and, and that we're good people. So um, and I think this, I, yeah. Do you think that people are unconsciously discriminating or that they are consciously suppressing the fact that they are uh, uh, actually racist? I think it's both. I think it's both. And I think, when we talk about somebody being a racist, we need to understand that we live in a society that has been created and conditioned by racism, by white supremacy. Um, where are the where who are the poor countries? Where are the rich countries? You know, um, we cannot we cannot disconnect global um, colonialism and 
and neoliberalism and all of these these conditions that have created um, inequality, we cannot disconnect it from individual racism. Um, and the reason why we can't disconnect it is because um, there's a reason why Africa is poor, you know? And, 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 and a lot of these ideas that individuals hold of Black people being more inadequate are based off of this global inequality. Oh, because Black people are more poor, because Black countries are less developed, that means that as individuals and as people, they must be inferior to us. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that, that their assumptions of racism literally gives them the opportunity to, to check their, to, to, to allow their assumptions to be seen as true. Okay, I need some time to process that. Um, so, but perhaps also because it's opening some blind spots that I wasn't aware of before. I mean, I mean, to, to, to explain it, why why is Africa why why is Africa underdeveloped? Right, Africa is underdeveloped because of the fact that colonialism um, and has destroyed a lot of the country's actual structures. When when Africa was divided, Europeans grabbed a they grabbed a me they grabbed a measuring tape and they were like, okay, this is how we're going to make it. They made straight lines from countries, yeah. and, and and what happened is that tribal structures and and, and, and borders, the natural borders were ignored, thereby pushing many people that are different from each other into under one single governing authority. Doing so has created many, many frictions and violence um, that in the past, I mean, there's always been violence in Africa, just like there's always been violence in Europe. Yeah. Uh, at least, for, it, it's always been the case. But what has happened is that they have artificially created certain um, spaces where oppression were ha was happening. And above them creating these borders, they also oppress the individuals there. Um, therefore, what is happening now, we, we, live in a, we live in a socially constructed reality. Um, our economic system is socially constructed and it was designed to serve Europe and the US. And I mean, it's a system that it, it helps us sometimes. You know, it's not, Nothing is inherently and fully evil. Um, everything has a function. Everything serves a good. Um, but mm -hmm. we need to be critical of where our systems comes from because the systems define the way that we see reality. Um, and I think, I think they, they tend to call our, our systems and our institutions our dream work. When, when we dream something into existence, um, that's, that becomes our reality. So, so, so when we talk about governments, governments aren't a thing but they are a thing because we believe them to be a thing and because we give it power over the way that it structures our lives. Um, and that's useful because that's what communities have always done. But at the same time, we all have to understand that when we do that, there are many blind spots, especially with minorities suffering oppression because we ignore it because it doesn't fit in our narrative of existence and reality. I don't know if you're following me, how that connects. I, 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 am, I am following you. And, and with the ignoring it, that aspect that, that um, resonates with me, because if, if I look at Article 1 of the Dutch Constitution, it says everybody who is in the Netherlands will be treated equally and will not be discriminated against no, no matter what religion you have, what race, what uh, gender, etc. Um, if you talk about the European Constitution on Human Rights, um, then Article 14 says, or European Convention on Human Rights, not a constitution. Article 14 says, um, <laughs> that was vetoed in uh, <laughs> the Netherlands and France uh, 15 years ago. So um, Article 14 contains a prohibition uh, of discrimination. And I mean, if you would ask me, or I think most people, they would say, yes, I fully support this and I want to make sure that, this, that, that we uphold this constitution and this convention. But still, it seems to be ignored. And um, uh, I find those two things hard to uh, grasp because both are, are happening in, at the same time and it seems paradoxical. And, and the truth is reality is paradoxical um, because we can, we can say something with our mouths and make it a law, but if it does not mean that we have to actually, when we don't do the work, when we don't do the work, then it's not gonna become a reality. You can say, 
um, the sky is purple. And then everybody can believe it, but the sky ain't gonna be purple. You know? Although yeah. Vault would love the sky to be purple. <laughs> But and, and, yes, that we would love, <laughs> we would love that. But um, the uh, it reminds me of this demonstration when it started raining and we started all singing purple rain, purple <laughs> rain. That was fun. Um, but um, what I want, uh, what I want to say is the um, um, examples of modern day institutionalized racism that we tend to ignore. Um, I, a friend of mine and another friend of mine that I spoke to about what is uh, a discrimination for you in, in the modern day and age told me that he has a foundation where he helps uh, people with uh, uh, who have a hard time learning, children who have a hard time learning, to get extra education. Mm. And he said, for my foundation, I took a board of advisors that all consisted of white males over 50 because I knew that it would enhance my chances of getting subsidies to make my foundation run. And I was actually pretty amazed by the fact that that's something he even had to take into account. And so I'm wondering what day-to-day -day, uh, discrimination or racism do you encounter? I mean, there's ethnic profiling. It was a couple of days ago, actually. I was sick. I, I think I had to go to the doctor and I was waiting for a tram. And then just minding my own visit, the police runs over to me um, with their car, like like literally at the Hague, and then steps up, gets out, and they're like, and then like they, they ask me, okay, so so where are you at the Albert Heijn? Where are you at the Albert Heijn? And I was like, no, I was not. And then they asked me for my information and stuff like that. And I was like, and, and they asked me to show me my to show them my hands. And I was like, oh no, you're not that person. And then they and then they ran away again. So so it happened so fast, and I was like, you know. That's actually messed up because yeah. what, because, because what was there, you know, just because someone is black doesn't mean that they're a criminal and doesn't mean that they're the person that you're looking for. If I am just standing there to grab the tramp, um, that's a, that's a clear example that it happened last month, you know, and these things happen often, you know, when it's going to the club, you know, in the Hague, there are some clubs that you know that you're not going to get into if you're black. Um, and, and it's like, they call it the racist triangle triangle. Um, really? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a thing. And black people are like, oh, yeah. And we make jokes about it. But it's it's definitely a thing. And it's very difficult to prove because when somebody comes, they'll be like, oh, no, it's because you're wearing the wrong shirt. Or, oh, no, it's because you smell like alcohol. That's happened to me once, I remember. And you um, didn't drink? You know, I didn't drink. I actually didn't <laughs> drink at all. I didn't. Yeah. And it was so funny. And I, I, and I made a big up about it but then people were like oh yeah but you know maybe it was the way that you were acting which is also another thing right blaming the victim is also a form of um you know co covert um racism that people say oh no but you were just you, you were just you just didn't try hard enough or you weren't nice enough or you weren't kind enough police brutality is another example ethnic profiling is a big thing in the netherlands there's an organization called control of delete control of delete and they do a lot of reports on ethnic profiling in the Netherlands. And there was a case of somebody getting murdered the same way that George Floyd got murdered um, a couple of years ago. And yeah. most of them got yeah. acquitted. His, uh, his name was Mitch Hendrik. Yeah, M M Mitch Henriquez. He was from Mitch Aruba. Henriquez. Yes, Mitch Henriquez was his name. Yeah, we should pronounce his name correct. Mitch Henriquez. They didn't correctly. Yes. Um, but yeah, so, so, so there's a lot of those things happening. Um, I mean, people that say they don't see color when I get invited to an event and I'm always the only black person, I'm like, okay, um, let's do this. I mean, it's nice. It's, it's, it's nice to be invited. At least you're trying, but, but that says something that there are no other people of color or black people there. Um, another thing that we can talk about is, yeah. That happens to, to, to events that I sometimes organize as well. And then I wonder like, what's the right way to do this? Because, um, um, and I, I think this is something that a lot of people experience and that also I experience sometimes is that I avoid this conversation because I'm afraid that I will do something wrong because for example I really like uh, 90s hip hop music like Dr. Dre is one of my favorite artists and I was listening to him and with, along with his songs and people told me it was cultural appropriation or 
Um, when you speak up, people say we don't want white saviors, but if you shut your mouth, you're also one of the oppressors. And it becomes so confusing that, I mean, it, it, it was necessary for uh, this to happen before we, as friends, have this conversation for the first time. And we've known each yeah. other for a couple of years now. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's definitely the thing, right? I think it's, it's it, obviously no one is perfect. and. I don't think people expect perfection. Um, I think what everybody expects in everybody is humility. You know, I think, I think conversations like these can happen if people are open and ready and willing and willing to be uncomfortable. Um, at, when, when we're willing to be uncomfortable, um, then a lot of beautiful things come out from it. You know, for example, cultural appropriation is a thing but it's there, is it singing a song is not cultural appropriation you know um something like i know what was the other example you used um that that for example if i speak up uh, against racism people will say who are you to speak up because you have no idea what you're talking about and we don't want white say white savior complex is a, is a thing that I learned about recently that um, um, it also has a, a, a if, I'm not sure whether I understand explain this correctly, but it has a way of oppression to say you need my help. Um, yeah. So, but so I don't I I just want to make sure that we actually treat each other equally. So, what can I do to help? Yeah. And I think the uh, the feeling of being afraid to do something wrong limits people from actually having the conversation yeah and i think fear fear is fear shouldn't be a thing right i think i think things like fear and oh my gosh i feel so guilty so i have to do something are i think they're problematic in and of themselves because because i should be wanting to hear and to learn from you I think one of the most important things is creating space and giving people the platform so that they can do something yeah. when, um, especially when it comes to talking about their own, their own experiences. You know, if, if we're going to talk about race, um, you could ask someone, Oh, do this. But at the same time, speaking about it isn't bad. Speaking about it is necessary, especially in environments where there aren't any people of color. And, 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 and that's also one of the examples of, of racism that is that highly permeates europe you know um people say racist things all the time especially when they're with their other white friends nobody challenges them you know nobody says you know that's not kind that's not that's not a good thing you know that's racist um and and, and when we we allow this silence to the silence continues to perpetuate discrimination and racism because people think it's okay to hold these thoughts because they are never challenged um so, so, so we have to talk about challenging people that continue to do that because, because racism, um, everybody has certain elements within them that are racist because we've been shaped by the system. We're biased people. We have prejudice within us. So we have to get, we have to get this idea out of our head that we are good. Nobody is fully good. There's always things. I, I always like to use this example that, you know, every single choice that you make leads you to a direction um if yeah. i can choose to do something bad today and that's a bad thing and if i continue to choose them then i i'm i'm willingly leading myself into a negative direction at the same time i can also choose to do good things um when we only consider ourselves to be good because of because of nominal action which is the same thing as declaring declaring that um we don't believe in racism in this country you know, what we're saying is that we don't have to check ourselves. You know, we don't have to do the work because we're not racist. We don't have to do the work because we're good people. Yeah, that's an uh, interesting uh, eye-opener for me as well. So you're saying a lot of uh, uh, things that um, are, new, are new to me and are, are I, I think, uh, appropriate to repeat because other people might learn from it as well. And repetition is a good way to learn. So you say create space to talk about it. Don't fear uh, the uh, uh, don't fear away from being uncomfortable and, and try to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. So open up this conversation. Don't pretend to be colorblind. Um, 
and nobody is fully good. So yeah, those are all uh, uh, things that, that I think are worth uh, repeating. What else would you advise uh, uh, people? This is already a lot, but if you have something else, then feel free Definitely. to Definitely. I mean, educating ourselves on injustice and educating ourselves on racial, racial issues is important. Um, the history that you receive in school is biased. Um, it's like, like, for example, in Curacao, we learn a lot about the Netherlands. Um, a lot of people in the Netherlands only know that Curacao exists and happens to be the part of the kingdom. Um, a couple of days ago, it was the 30th of May. And the 30th of May is like this very important date in Curacao history, where there were protests that were being done for racial equality, racial justice, and economic justice for workers of Shell. Um, because Curacao had a, a, a Shell refinery there. And, and that was also, that, that, that protest was also fought pretty violently. Um, but ultimately the protesters won and there were a lot of reforms that came on Curacao because of that. Um, mm -hmm. Also people being able to speak their own language in parliament, for example. And how long ago were these protests? Um, this was 1969. Um, so it wasn't that long ago, oh. right? Like, like my, my parents were alive. I, my aunt told me, oh, she remembers that day. Um, and, and that tells you that there is a lot of history that is being, um, and, and that, that's also a form of racism, right? Where, where we erase history of people that live in this country because we want a single narrative. We want to talk about, we want to talk about how great we were. We, there are good things that came from the Netherlands and there are bad things. Recognizing them both on, makes us understand that, that our role as people is great and that we need to keep ourselves responsible. Um, we need to hold ourselves accountable, otherwise injustice continues to breed. And you can see that, just look at the Second World War, you think every single person that participated was evil and bad when they, when they were fighting people, they weren't. But they've convinced themselves that what they were doing was good, and that what they were doing was justified, and they were not checked. You know, and, and that's the same thing that happens again and again. That, that's what breeds genocide. Um, closing your mind and not thinking critically and not allowing people to speak into your life in a critical way, um, it, it stops you from receiving any type of feedback and it allows you to continue into the negative direction or the positive one, but mostly negative direction that you choose to go. Yeah. Um, so we have to be open for criticism and we have to be open to, for humility. Yeah. Yeah, so educate ourselves. We should be speak. I forgot that in my previous uh, summary. Speak up when you encounter uh, injustice or discriminatory remarks. Um, to be honest, I think I've been present when those things happened in the past. I'm 30 years old. Like I, I've definitely been present at uh, uh, in in uh, events or th things where racist stuff was said, and I did not speak up myself. So I will try, or not, will try, I will do that in the future. Um, and recognize the good and the bad things in our own history. Um, and allow yourself to be open to criticism and show humility. Yeah. And I think, I think we should be kind to ourselves in this journey also, because it's hard. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's hard for everybody. Um, it's definitely hard for black people, but it's also hard for others to understand a story that is that is different than their own and and to be to have the humility because because white privilege is a thing. and privilege, um and I told you this before, privilege doesn't mean that you don't have struggles. Privilege doesn't mean that you stop don't suffer pain. What privilege means is that you you are given an opportunity and you are given a gift. I, just like I am given this I, I have this gift. Um, that you've given me th this conversation, our friendship. I am privileged because of that. I am privileged to, to, to study in the Netherlands. I am privileged to, to know amazing people, to have a great family. Um, and, and just because I'm privileged in those areas doesn't mean that I'm, I do not have other types of oppression, you know, racial injustice, economic injustice, um, and people can be poor, people can be disabled, people can be hurt, they can be on the LGBTQ spectrum. Um, a lot of those things can also cause issues, but at least race isn't one of them if you have white privilege. Um, 
So, so, so understanding that your privilege makes you blind for, in, for certain injustices, it calls you to action to continuously reach out to the people that have different experiences than you. And anti-racism is a self-development journey. Um, it's, a, it, it, it's a call to action to develop yourself. We're, yeah. we're becoming better people because of the work that we're doing. Because the work isn't just outside, it's also inside. Yeah, actually, that's true, because that happened to me as well when it comes to Black Pete. I, I celebrated that as a kid. I knew no, I knew no difference. And I, I also come from an uh, uh, environment that's predominantly white. I had zero uh, people of color in my uh, lower school and only three in my high school. So um, for me, that was just what I knew. And then when I heard for the first time that people thought that was racist, I was like, no, it's just a party. Why? Uh, why do you think it's racist? And it, it took me some years, actually, to sort of see, well, actually, I think this is wrong. And I think yeah. we should, uh, um, uh, in a society that's multicultural, like if, if we, uh, as the Dutch claim to be a tolerant country for 400 years because people had freedom of religion, although you might say that in the past 30 years we have grown to become less and less and less tolerant with right-wing party that are anti-Muslim, but if, if, if you pretend to be this tolerant country, or at least are proud of that, then embrace it fully and don't do, uh, and don't attach to symbolism that is suppressing and, uh, and, and keeps up this negative stereotype. Definitely. And I, I would even say, too. yeah, 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 yeah. I, and I would say just because, you know, it doesn't invalidate that you didn't enjoy, you, you enjoyed it. You know, because because you were innocent and that's what you thought it was. But when we are aware that it is wrong, when, you know, it doesn't it doesn't take away the enjoyment that you've had where you're like, okay, let's do something different then. You know, because I understand that the role that I'm playing into this is also destructive towards other communities. So um, I care for you. I empathize with you. So I choose to do something that brings you to life and not something that puts you to death, not something that oppresses you and continues to create um, a space for racism and injustice to, to, have, to have place, to, to, to have joy, to have growth. Yeah. So it's also a self-development journey. Yeah, definitely. Because, because once you start recognizing that, you start becoming against all types of injustice in others, but also in yourself. You're like, mm, you know, this is not a good thing because it hurts someone. This is not a good thing because it denies someone their humanity. And then you start challenging yourself um, to, to, to become better, to do better. And I think as a society, um, and I think that's also one of the biggest um, consequences of racial injustice on white people is that they've become apathetic to doing the work inside. Um, and then there's this idea of white fragility that when you challenge someone um, about a specific thing, they directly um, enter into the defensive state, you know, especially when it comes to race. race. You're does, like when what, you say... What does yeah? the word fragility mean? I don't know that word. Fragility means fragile. It's like when you, when you grab a glass and you drop it and then it breaks. Yes. Ah. Um, people yeah, getting absolutely. defensive and being and challenged. And people get defensive. Yeah, and then this reaction when whenever it's something that is not centering, because because one of the biggest issues about racism is also that white is seen as normal. White is centered as a normative experience of everybody, which is also why in the Netherlands we use the word uh, we use the word blank for white people, which 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 is very nor it's a very normative word. Like blank is normal, and then black people are zwart. Zwart is black, but but blank means blank, like a blank slate. Um, so that's why, for example, which has, a more, example, which, has yeah. a, which has a more positive connotation. Well, well, so for example, if we use that's why we use wit. We use wit white because because white is it, because if you're going to call yeah if you're going to call someone black, then call the other person white. Don't call one person black and then the other person um blank. Um, you yeah. know, you you see the difference in in how uh, how that impacts communities where, where, where whiteness is seen as something that is unquestioned, while blackness is seen as something that is weird, from something that is strange and bizarre and exotic. Um, so, and um, do you think it is becoming better? 
this might be a very su uh, suggestive question. Uh, how do you think it develops might be better? Um, so there are good things and there are bad things. I think right now we're in a very race conscious period where people are finally awakening to the fact that race is a thing and suddenly people are understanding, you know, black feet is racist. Um, so, so people are, people are becoming more of it, aware of it. If we look at the U.S., what's happening right now, you know, people are becoming more aware of it and are choosing to, to stand up for justice. Um, so, so, so I'm very hopeful for the future, especially with regards to individuals and communities, because they're finally taking that stand. At the same time, I would say that um, there is a counter reaction. There is definitely a backlash that we need to, we need to fight, not just on an institutional level, but within ourselves and also help others to, 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 to think about that in themselves. So, so, so there, there are many good things. But there's also this, this consistent threat of like extreme right wing um, resurgence um, because of fragility, because of insecurity, because they feel that black people or people of color are a threat to their livelihood, a threat to their existence. And that also comes from old racist ideas, you know, that blacks and um, other people, Arabs are brutish. Um, blacks are brutish people, you know, um, that, that, and what's interesting, right, is that it is a reflection of what has already happened in the past. Because we assume, we're, the, the assumption is that the way that we treated people is the same way that they will treat us. So if we have treated them brutally and have enslaved them, um, them being in the majority of our country will treat us brutally and will enslave us too and will treat us badly and will be second rate citizens in our country. Um, but that assumption has nothing to do with reality. It has everything to do with the collective and the the generational legacy that white supremacy has had on people of color and also on white people themselves. And, and do you think that people have, think this consciously? Because I mean, I would be one of those people, and I definitely do not think that consciously. Or definitely not. People don't people don't think this consciously at all because it's not something that is thought about. It's something that is a given. Um, whiteness is a normality. It's unquestioned. You know, and 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 everything outside of it is a threat to the normality, you know, because if white people are not the majority anymore in this country, then that's not normal. And yeah. something being not normal is a threat. Yeah. Wow, this, this gives me a lot of food for thought. Uh, thanks, Gilberto. Um, I mean, uh, Fold was, was founded to, uh, or why was Fold founded? Like our core mission is because we believe that only a Europe that acts together can solve our shared challenges. And one of those shared challenges of the 21st century is creating an inclusive society where we actually truly uphold what's in the first article of our constitution and in the 14th article of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is equal chances and equal treatment for everybody. And um, it takes a journey in myself, as I've learned from you, but I hope that this conversation we have and if people see it and they listen to it with an open heart and an open mind that that will move this uh, debate and this uh, conversation further towards that inclusive society definitely I, I just want to thank you guys also for your commitment towards inclusion and justice um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done um, but as long as we continue to engage and continue to reach out to people and continue to connect um, uh, we will do it and then we will win. But if we don't do it, we ain't gonna win. So, so yeah, we, 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 gotta, we gotta continue reaching out and, and challenging those things in ourselves that don't serve us and that don't serve our communities and that don't serve people that look like us and people that don't look like us. Because yeah. we're, all, we're all people. As I said from before, you know, racism came before race. So when we end racism, that's when we can start talking about other things. That's when we can start thinking about a post-race society. But we can't do it yet because um, racism still exists. And I would like to also end with repeating what you said, and that is that everybody should also be kind to yourself. And I would like to add that, that and be kind to others because that is the very first step towards that more inclusive society. Definitely. It's always, I, I always like to say, be kind. Don't be nice. Uh -huh. Because niceness is 
Niceness is just acting, while kindness requires us to see the other as, as a whole person. Um, and when I am kind to you, I do not want to treat you badly. I do not want to be racist. I do not want to be, 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 be unkind. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to call you names. I don't want to commit violence against you because I'm kind. But if I'm nice to you, I just talk politely. Good distinction. Thanks, man. Every time we talk, uh, I learn something new. <laughs> Thanks, Roberto. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. And um, I guess we'll see each other on the 8th of July. I think there's a next event where we'll, we will be having dinner together. Um, so I look forward to see you, seeing you then. Yes. And have a great day slash evening. <laughs> Thanks. You too. Bye, Roberto. Bye. Thank you for the talk.